Um, okay, so um, now I'm very happy to uh, say hello to Heti, who is from Vienna, and it's really by coincidence that he's here uh, on 20th edition of OpenFest uh, with us. Um, we are very privileged and lucky. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, IT security fuck-ups of uh, 2021st. As um, note for this presentation is that uh, no IT security experience is needed in this case. Uh, Heti is uh, IT security expert who is uh, a big fan of IT security and uh, geek stuff. Good luck. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. So my talk is, a, is, is called Security is Far in Borkenland. Uh, IT still burns hard. Um, first, I start with a content warning. In the end of the talk, I will speak about digital surveillance of people, especially women, and human rights violation. I will have another content warning just before the content. So, who am I? Who I am? I'm, I'm Hetty. I'm from MetaLab Vienna, the Hackspace. Uh, I am um, also part of the Chaos Computer Group Vienna. Uh, I also do capture the flag with the academic uh, capture the flag team we own you, and I'm also a T security expert. So, first of all, why this talk? So security vulnerabilities affect us all, and often the problem is the security lingo, like all the words around it, because it first hinders classification, and the second thing is it either eases or under or over reacting about security bugs. Um, and this leads to that most, the concrete impact is mostly, mostly unknown to like normal people because they can't classify it or they can't like work with it. First with the roadmap, so we do some basics and then we have some various categories about uh, where I would show what security fuckups happened uh, in this thing. It's just stuff you know, probably email, VPNs, printers, office, whatever. So first with the basics, some IT security basics. The first one is the fundamentals of IT security. It's called CIA, the CIA triad. It's called uh, the C is for confidentiality. So it means everything that you that is available should only be available to people that are allowed to see it. I is for integrity. So it only it should not be uh, changed by anyone. So you shouldn't be able to manipulate the data. And A is for availability. So the data should be available all the time you need it. So that are the three fundamentals. And in a secure system, all of the three should be uh, should be um, should be available. So for this talk, you need to know what CVE is. So CVE is, uh, is Common Vulnerability Enumeration. It's an ID for vulnerabilities. Uh, you, there, is, there are organizations that ha hand you out CVEs if you submit the bug. And you get, it's like an identifier for a bug or for a vulnerability. It has a specific format. It's called a CVE, then the year, and then a ID. For example, that's CV 2021-29908. That's a, that's a legit vulnerability. You can check it out later what kind of it. But that's the example how this uh, ID is, um, looks like. And in combination with CV, there is also CVSS. So CVSS is called Common Vulnerability Scoring System. It's a kind of scoring system uh, to score to, to show how critical the vulnerability is. So it's a scale from zero to 10. So zero is like it's not dangerous at all. But like if it's like a, a score of 10, then, the, that, then that's a super critical bug, which is super, super dangerous. And if you have like a 10 in your, in your, in your software, then you should like turn it off or, or get it like unavailable. And if it's running on the internet, you should really just disconnect it from the internet, for example. And I will come to this later, but this scoring is quite subjective. I will show you an example why. So, and then the last thing, 100% security does not exist. That's the most important thing you should know. There is no 100% security. We're gonna start with email. So who of you loves email? <laughs> Raise your hands. No one? One, two persons? Okay, so most of you don't like emails. Fine, I also don't like emails. But uh, the thing is, it's more or less in all organizations and companies, you use emails to get the contracts to, to exchange with companies. And there were some highlights in 2021. There was Microsoft Exchange, I mean, okay, it's still broken anyway this year too, but the last year, of course. And there is Sonic Wall email security, and there's also Exim. Exim was quite broken, there were quite 21 bucks in there, but I will not uh, go into details this time for Exim. But the other two are gonna show you now. 
So the first is Microsoft Exchange. Um, last year, um, there were quite some bugs. So Microsoft Exchange is an email server where you can uh, host it in your company. And you can get emails, send emails out. And it's quite popular and widely used in companies. And there are two full exploit chains. So what is exploit chain? So when you have multiple bugs and you combine them to exploit something, then it's an exploit chain. Like first you find a bug to log in without authorization, and then you find like a bug to, to, to run some code when you're logged in. And if you combine them, you have probably an unauthorized um, remote code execution. And there are proxy logon and proxy shell, and there are like half a year uh, ahead of each other. And they allowed a complete takeover of the email server and of the emails and everything. So it was really a bad bug. And even criminal groups uh, abused that and attacked companies and uh, ransomware them or um, stole some data or infiltrated the network. So they were really bad bugs. And, uh, and even now, in this year, several exchange bugs were there, which also allowed for a complete takeover of the mail system. Um, so, for, as another email solution, there is SonicWall Email Security. It's a specialized software, and it's also advertised as a secure solution. But uh, 2000, 2021, there were three vulnerabilities, and if you combine them, you have quite a powerful impact. So, you had the first was an unauthorized administrative account creation, so you could just create the admin account without any any special authorization. That's quite bad, so you have a CVSS score of 9.8. And then, when you're logged in, you could like upload your own files, and you could also, also download and read arbitrary files. So in the end, you could in the end upload some files and replace something, or you just can, for example, read the, read the configuration files and get the passwords, whatever. But you need for that for the last two uh, bugs, you need already have an account. But if you can already create the admin account, how you like it, you can just abuse the other two. And those bugs were used in targeted attacks. So criminals used this and uh, attacked companies. So it was a quite bad uh, bug combination that was exploited by, by companies. And I mean, you don't like emails. I also don't like emails, but you see, you will you will not get email dead. So it will be it's, it's here to stay probably. But I mean, there are other solutions too. But in the end, email gonna stay. Um, so VPNs, you probably know virtual private network. So it was quite often used in the pandemic because people went to home office most of the time and they still need somehow to connect to the company network. So VPN is in the end. Uh, a, ton, a secure tunnel to your company network. Uh, you install a software on your computer, and then you connect to the company network over a secure channel, and then can access the resources, websites in the network. And often, because of the pandemic, the administration people didn't have a lot, a lot enough time to make a proper configuration of the VPN. And uh, so it happened that sometimes they made some configuration mistakes, or um, often it happens that they didn't even have enough resources that, that, er, that, everyone, that not everyone could connect to the company network. And as already said, uh, it allows normally the full access to the internal network of the company, which is quite dangerous if you have like not patched system in a company and, and attackers get inside. So there is um, um, a VPN gateway from Pulse Connect, Pulse Connect Secure, and it was quite bad because you could completely take over this VPN gateway. Uh, so attacker could steal all the credentials, they could log in with these, uh, they could modify the server and also modify the configuration. And of course, they also could delete just log files and try and avoid to be detected. Like, normally we want to, we want to be avoided that you get detected, and so you can just do that. And also, um, the one problem for this one is, that updates for this device were quite complex and they require downtime. So if you don't have a second uh, VPN gateway, you need to take this offline. So you need either do it uh, at night when no one is working or on the weekends. So normally, I mean, big companies have more, more of those so they can up update it uh, 
while the other ones are working, but some companies only have one of the VPN gateways and they need to update it while, while people are not working because if they update it while people are going to work, they can't connect to the, to the network. So that's also a problem for this bug. Um, another, um, another thing you probably know or have in your company is wiki or knowledge management. So it should not miss in any company because you need somehow to document your, or at least I hope you document your stuff in your company. But uh, you have like documentation inside, you have often names and contacts of employees or employers. You have infos about the systems and networks normally in there. Many more, maybe you have some contracts, some, some, some other information, maybe some information for, for, for private information of your product, how it works, some, some um, other things. And so it's, it's a really gold mine of data, and if you get access to a wiki, man, wiki system, you can get quite a lot of information and also use it against the company, or use it to get more information in, in a network. And there was a quite bad case last year with Atlassian Confluence. So it's a wiki software from Atlassian, and it's widely used in organizations. Um, and there was a vulnerability in August that it allowed arbitrary code execution. So you could just uh, execute code on the server, on the wiki server. So you could just like add your own account, get all the data, maybe change something on the database. So you can just do everything on it, more or less. And you don't need to authenticate, so you don't need any credentials for that. And it's also, again, CVS score of 9.8, so super bad. And even though this year, some weeks ago, that I got, again, some remote code execution on the, on, the, on the Atlassian wiki. So it's, you see software, you use it every day, and it says still a lot of bugs, and it's, it can be quite dangerous. And I mean, normally in companies, you have your wiki in your internal network, not, not on the internet. But often companies have their, their wiki on the internet because of different reasons, because uh, some volunteers use it or you want it on, on have it on a public. But if, it's, if it is public on the internet, it's quite dangerous that it gets hacked if it has such a vulnerability. So um, you, you, you know we are still in a pandemic and we are in a digital age. And uh, when you go and get the COVID test, you normally like want to get the digital test result as a PDF, whatever, that you can show on your phone. And the problem is there are very sensitive health data. And like your test result, your name, when you were born, maybe your phone number, like they're very sensitive data. And this stuff, the software that, that handles that should be programmed by security by default. But I will show you one solution where this did not happen at all. And that's quite bad. So I'm going to tell you about the Safe Play Test Center solution. Um, it was done by Zerforschung. Zerforschung is a German research group of German researchers that uh, do quite a cool stuff. They research uh, and um, make IT security. They, they, they test software on IT security bugs and then have blog posts and report about that. So Safe Play Test Center solution is a full software suite for test centers. They can like uh, put in the test results. They can um, send out emails and PDFs and everything. It's a Viney, Viney startup that made that. And yeah, it got researched by Zerforschung because they were at some test center and got some COVID test. And then they got the email and then they started to analyze it, what's happening there. And well, the result is a complete disaster. So there is this blog post, it's in German, still worth maybe to check it out and translate it. Um, I'm gonna show you what happened and uh, how, how brutal it is. So they got this email and it says, yeah, it's a German one, but it says the test result is negative and you can, you can download the PDF report to your, to your computer. So you, they click on the button PDF report and when they do that, they got the PDF. And you see it's, it's a PDF, it's, it's a negative result, but you see here it's, everything is blacked out. So you have like name, sure name, um, you have like the street, uh, when the person was born, even which kind of citizenship the person has, um, mobile number, even uh, the number of the, of the ID card. And email address, so a lot of very sensitive data, and you don't want to have it in other in, in other hands. And also where they like where they live and everything, so it's 
quite a big problem if, if someone else get those data. So they they checked out um, when they when they when they got this this PDF, they analyzed the uh, the web request what happened when they clicked on this button. So there was some API endpoint with um, with this address, and as a result, you got back like uh, the whole PDF file with all the data. But in the end, when you when you check out this API, you see report ID like one two three four five. And then say, okay, interesting. What if we just change the ID to one, two, three, four, four? And then they got just another test result from another person. Like they, and it was in the end, they could really could start from one and count up, and they could get like every test result that was, uh, was uh, done by the company. Like super shitty, and also, one does not simply use incremental IDs, please. So that's the, that's the first thing. And also, normal use for this, you use like unique IDs that get, that get um, done by, by some random generator. So that's, and that's really a bad bug, because um, you could get all this sensitive data from all other people that went to this test center, and it is, that's, so they didn't, didn't have any security in mind when programming this application. And in the end, that shouldn't be possible. You should have some security check while programming such solution that, that uh, have health data of people in there. And it should be even by law that, that people should uh, test this and have some specific test cases to avoid such failures. Um, so you see, even if it's very sensitive data, companies have really bad experience in coding such stuff, and it's it's very dangerous and, and and quite a bad problem. And it was not the only one. They had like several of them, like four or five softwares they checked with COVID results and they got like results like this. And even in one case, they managed to, to create their own test results with their fake name. So they just make a fake name for a fake person and get the negative result for that. Super bad. Um, so you probably know um, printing. So who of you loves to manage printers? I see no one here. Uh, one, no? Okay. Uh, so they are everywhere, the printers. And yeah, they just work or they do not work. Depends on the mood of the printer and uh, if there is like sun or not. And in the end, printers are extremely complex hardware and all the software behind it. And um, I also don't like printers but we need to deal with them anyway. So there was one quite bad bug, it called printer nightmare, and um, it was a vulnerability in the printer, Microsoft printer spool service. So the, what is the printer spool or service? So it's, it's a service that, uh, it's like a queue, so if you send a job to the printer, it gets to the printer spool or service, and this service sends then the, the data to the printer to print it out. So if multiple people want to print something out, it gets uh, to the spooler service and it handles the queue and sends the stuff to the printer. And it's a software running on your operating system or on a server. And uh, the bug was known since, since June 2021 and it allowed local privilege escalation. So that means if I have just limited rights on my system and I attack this puller service, I can get admin, admin rights. So I have full, full control over my system. And so the problem was, in this case, there was like, fix me if you can. So the first, first we issued the first patch, but security researchers could like circumvent the patch and still abuse it. Then they patched this one, and I think they even um, so that they came the second patch, and I think even in the second patch they found a way to, to bypass it again. So I think that they, they tried to fix it two times until they fixed it somehow. But the problem is on the one time they issued multiple CVs for the different bugs, and so it was quite a CV confusion, confusion because they changed some CVs and everything, and there is only like only one CV that's like allowed to be told that's the print nightmare CV. And also the big problem is there are still printer problems until today after the patches. So it's still somehow broken. And it's still a bad bug because if you get like access on a Windows system that is not patched, you can just get admin rights and you have full control over the system. Very bad. So who of you is uh, programming in Java? Not a lot of people. Okay, one person too. Um, yeah, Java is everywhere. 
and it also just works or not, depends uh, how good you're doing it. And it's, it's also extremely complex, the whole concept, and it's enterprise, because it's like in all the fancy software out there. And there are quite some bugs in, in Java software too. And one of the most prominent bugs was, um, was this one. So it was, the, it was a bug in a logging library, log4j. So log4j is a library where you can log errors and messages and everything, and then you can like collect it and get the central logging system for that. And you just embed it in your software. And um, the, the title up there is, is just a, uh, a string, a text, and that was like, uh, that would be an actual exploit code. <coughs> so the code, the exploit code was public since December 21. And what does it allow? So it allows unauthenticated, unauthenticated remote code execution. So you don't need any logins, whatever, and you could just run your own code on a, on a, on a server from someone. And it was super easy, exploitable. And the biggest problem about this one is it's extremely widespread. Like there is, um, there are a lot of software running log4j, and you maybe don't even know that the software is log4j. Maybe only the vendor knows that. And it's super easy to exploit. There are even some public exploit codes out there, and you can just try, um, use it yourself and and you exploit it. And the problem is it's so widespread that it would be a really big disaster. But somehow, I don't know, somehow, luckily, we as, a, as a IT security people, IT people got still quite uh, lucky because it wasn't that hard exploited uh, as we would thought of because it's so wide in all the products out there that still they didn't manage to exploit it on a, on a really wide uh, base, at least that we don't that we know of. It can still be that they exploit and have some backdoors in their system and coming back later, but um, until then, it seems it's what okay. But still, a lot of companies were quite nervous when this bug came out, and they immediately started to have like crisis meetings and think how, how to fix the stuff, how to check if you're already compromised. Uh, so they were really, really nervous because this bug was really had a bad impact on the whole network and on the whole company. So next to Log4j, there was another, so this one was really a bad, bad bug. But then uh, a little bit later, they, there came Spring for Shell. Spring for Shell is, also, is a Java Spring framework. It was also a remote code execution vulnerability. But Spring for Shell was also somehow hyped on the internet, but the problem with this one is um, it's not abusable in the default configuration because at Log4j, you don't need to configure anything special. You can just abuse it. You install Log4j, and that's it, and you can abuse it. For Spring for Shell, you need a specific configuration that is not default. So you need to really configure something special, and then you can abuse it. So it was totally overhyped. I mean, of course, it's a bad bug with uh, remote code execution but you still need a very specific configuration to abuse that one. And of course, people wrote on Twitter, oh my god, another, another RC on, on Java, uh, Spring for Shell, but it wasn't, it wasn't that bad as it, at, at Log4G, so it was totally overhyped. So next, you like Office? I, I like Office in the way of exploiting it. So, <laughs> You hardly anyone lives without it. I mean, everyone uses like Office to make some, uh, some uh, I don't know, you need to write something, uh, and it's very attractive for attackers. I mean, especially Microsoft Office has some great features like legacy features and backwards compatibility, so that you support really old formats, but that's also quite a bad, um, bad thing. And a lot of, as, as already said, a lot of people use it in the, in the daily life in companies. So if you can attack Office, you can attack the computers and the whole network if you, have, if you can uh, run code. So normally you want to have run code, and Office was very often used to deploy ransomware on the computers and then encrypt the whole network and everything. Be and the thing is, most of the time you get like uh, you, you got like a document with like some macro warning and some text to say, "Hey, you need to enable macros that it f works." And when you enable the macro, 
you the the code started and then some malware was started and maybe ransomware was loaded and then encrypted your, your thing. But still, normally you need to open the document and you still need to click like, yes, I want to enable the macro. So you need normally two steps to do that. But I will show you one bug uh, that was CV 2021-4444, which was a remote code execution in Microsoft Office documents. But the problem was, you just need to open the document, and that's it, and the code was running. So you didn't need to print, click on, okay, I want to run macros. You didn't need that. You just opened the document, and the code was running. And the one problem was, it was abused before the patch was out there. And of course, documents are still sent out from phishing mails, and people like, hey, open this very nice receipt to buy, to pay something. And one of these problems about this bug was, there were again proof of concept code programs out there on the internet, which allowed people that don't have technical knowledge to make their own office documents that are malicious. So you don't need to understand the bug, you can just use this program and create your own malicious documents. And it abused some kind of um, Microsoft HTML uh, rendering engine of the, that, uses, um, that uses the Microsoft browser in, in the back end of the, of, the, of the document. So it's quite a bad bug. And also there was another bug uh, I just mentioning here is Folina. It was also another bug which has the, had the same impact. You can just run code and you only need to open the document. So no further interaction here, just opening the document. And if you remember, if you remember in the beginning, I told that um, CVSS numbers are quite uh, quite subjective, and I tell you now why. So, what is the CVSS number of this of this CV? Um, we have one time. I don't know if you can read it, but it's like uh, we have. I forgot to mention there is CVSS 3.0 as a version and 2.0 as version. And we're gonna, uh, we're gonna focus on the 2.0 version, that's the second number. So it's like 7.9 as a CVSS score for this, for this bug. That's, um, that is the Microsoft um, adversary for, for this bug. And then there is another version which says it's a CVSS number of 6.8. So it's a totally, totally different score. And then there is even a third scoring from, from, the, from the NIST, which says it has a score of 7.8. So we have three different scores for the same CV, CV, CV number. So the question is, what is the correct score? Well, it's homework for yourself to, to make the correct calculations. Maybe you get one of the three numbers. Or you get even your own number. All right, so uh, after, after Office, after printing, after COVID stuff, I mean, we are still in a pandemic, so there are video conference solutions to people to meet online. Uh, it was broadly used due to COVID, and there are quite some nice possible attack goals for such software, like you could maybe meet, um, hijack the meeting, uh, you could do espionage, like being like undercover in the meeting and just listening to the, to the stuff the people are showing and, and telling each other. I mean, the, the, the best thing would, would be like for attackers that they could like just attack the machine of the attendees through the software, which is quite an interesting idea. And um, I have one, one, one vulnerability. Um, so most of you probably know Zoom or used it already. And there was a Zoom update fail vulnerability. So the Zoom installer um, had a bug that it only checked the executable and libraries, but you could embed your own scripts into the into the installer, and the scripts were not checked. So you could like ship a legit Zoom installer to the person with your malicious scripts, and the person will start the installer, everything is signed and everything is legit, and during the installation process, your malicious script will be will be executed, and you have like code execution on the client. And it was discovered during a red team assessment. Uh, so a red team assessment is a longer IT security assessment that normally goes over one to six months, depending on the, on, the, on the project. And the idea is normally to infiltrate the whole company and get access to internal data. So there are specific goals during the assessment. And it has quite some phases, like first you do like open source intelligence, like gather some data, like who is working there, where, whatever. Where is the company, what the technology they use. And afterwards, you're planning how to infiltrate the whole company or the network. 
There is a really nice blog post about that. And so it was then used to attack the C level of the company. So they sent out a mail to a mail to the CEO and told, hey, here's the IT department, we have an update for you for a Zoom client. And he just downloaded the binary, run the update, and they got like a reverse shell, so they get access to his computer. And uh, also one problem with that is, like Zoom is a signed binary, so it's, it has a signature from Zoom, it is legit. And normally, if you have some legit software, antivirus systems, they normally don't, don't really care about if you have a really legit binary that is signed by, by a legit company, and if you run with that malicious code. So normally, it can happen that it don't get flagged as malicious because it's, it's really okay binary, even though it's a malicious script that gets run by it. So, um, so that's and there even other other Zoom fails. In uh, there was some quite cool talk from from a Google Project Zero researcher that used another another bug, and with that bug he he abused the Zoom update fail vulnerability to run malicious code. Um, so now I already told there is a content warning, and I'm going to talk about digital surveillance of humans, especially women, and human rights violation. Uh, in this next topic. So about smartphones. Everyone has a smartphone probably, or most of you. And it's a gold mine for that. You have there your contacts, you have probably your emails. And the biggest problem is often you hardly up there are hardly updates for most devices. If you buy a smartphone, if you have a newer one from Samsung, for Google, from from other companies, you probably get monthly or every three months an update. But if you get some, some cheap Chinese one or some other older up phone or use it one, you won't get any updates anymore for that. It's like one time buy, bought and no updates anymore. And that's quite bad because if there's some new bugs out there, you won't get fixes for that. And also one big problem is if you have some state actors like uh, criminals or like groups or criminals that are backed by a, by a country, for example, and you have also the telecommunication companies behind them, and they can work together. And you have some really bad bug in the, in the, in the smartphone software. There you have extreme possibilities to exploit smartphones on a, on a, on a large scale in the, in the country. So if you have some smartphone that is connected to the base station of the mobile provider, you can abuse it with such bug and uh, infiltrate or, or have a backdoor on the phone if there is a bug in such way. So I first want to tell you about um, Pegasus. Uh, maybe you heard of it. Um, it's a surveillance software from NSO Group. So NSO Group is a is a Israeli company that um, offers as a service surveillance software for governments and. Uh, it's a very bad company because in the end they they spy on on human right they, the software is used to spy on journalists human rights activists and and very and, and various different groups and com and governments use that to to target them and they use this software and there was and Pegasus is one of those products from from the NSO group and the problem was this is quite a super powerful software and you could completely take over a smartphone with, in this case, without any interaction of the person. So the smartphone just need to, not just need to be uh, um, turned on, be available, and in this case, you got like, um, like a very sp special iMessage on your phone, and your phone was completely taken over, they had full access on your phone and could do whatever they wanted. And it was even able in August 2021 on a fully patched device. So you have a new phone, fully patched, and it could be abused and attacked and get the complete takeover of the phone. No interaction needed. So it's, it's super dangerous. Uh, so phones are quite, quite, a, quite a targeted device. And you see, it's, it's still software in the end. I mean, Apple and Google are still working very hard to have secure operating system for the phone. But you see, there's often bugs that can be abused to have fully access to the phone remotely without any countermeasures. I mean, I say they're still working a lot on, on these problems, but I would not trust phones on very, very secure and very um, important things. Um, another thing, another problem is also consumer spyware. 
So there is software that is marketed as, uh, there is surveillance software that is marketed. One thing is like for children or for employees. And the marketing is like for worried parents or for C-leveling companies to, to track their employees. And the thing is, most of those software is uh, installed uh, on their phones with physical access. So they have the phones and install it on the device. And sometimes they even use some phone vulnerabilities to hide the existence of the software. Like they install it, then they use a vulnerability, and then they're not, you can't see that it's installed on the phone. And this is often also abused for stalking and surveillance of partners. And it's, I heard also of cases of a person telling me they got, uh, they got a present from their partner, a new phone, and this phone had surveillance software on it, and they were spied on by their partner, and they got this phone as a present. So that's a quite a big problem. And it's also a problem for, 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 for NGOs that helping women that are getting stalked or swilled. They have really problems to, because they don't often have the technical knowledge to see if the person is revealed with their phone. And that's a quite big problem that, that it still be sold by companies and be still be used by them. So we are getting more or less to the end. Um, first of all, I mean, I think in 2021, uh, I mean, I, I don't have any more gifts for this stuff because she is quite broken, everything. Um, and I mean, we're already in the year 2022. And I think in 2022 is like, uh, ah, shit, here we go again. So it's still so much broken stuff out here. And it's, it's an endless fight and we still need to do that. And we still need to... to f um, to help people, to educate them, to, to, to go for secure software, and we also need to, also to, to, to work with governments and tell them that they need to, to tell the companies that they need to do so secure software. For example, with the COVID software stuff, that shouldn't have, it shouldn't have happened ever like this, but it happen, happens all the time. So in the end, um, thank you very much. Stay safe and patch your systems. And if you have some questions, Talk to me, ask here. Uh, you can write my metrics, but don't write me emails, please. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, folks, we still have eight more minutes. So if you want to ask something, you can come here in the middle of the hall. Hi. So my question is, oh, okay, so now, okay, now you hear me. So my question is more as a suggest, like, what would you suggest? Because for people who are new in the industry and in software development, I think that security is more, more of a reactive um, thing rather than a proactive. So how do you embed security in the mind of the programmer? Like, what would you suggest like what recipe would you give with what steps would be included in that recipe so that someone proactively thinks about security and it's not something that oh wait uh, yeah so really that's, that's a good question and there is no universal uh, answer for that but one problem is for example security in coding isn't often teached it say you code that, you, that's how you code it, but no one says, okay, watch out, you can have some bug there, that's a classic security bug. So the first thing is, when you teach people coding, you also teach them what security is and why you should think about that. The other thing is, you should, when you, when you have software, you should proactively use CI, CD pipelines with security checks inbound. And of course, uh, make regular testing by penetration tests in a big company, by code reviews with other people. And as I said, the, the, I think the biggest important thing is to have awareness for people that are starting in coding and also already code that security is important. Also privacy, like when you code, you should have like privacy by default, you should have security by default, and you need to tell people that's important because if the, because one problem is if you call your software and you need to fix security bugs afterwards, it's getting much harder. Instead, if you start ev even with security in mind and implement security measures when starting to code, because fixing stuff afterwards kinda can get messy or hard to implement. So when you start even with security in mind, it should be getting easier later on if you have some bugs, because you have already security in mind while coding it.
Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, nice. Hi, thanks for your interesting lecture. Uh, so in terms of the smartphones and maybe not only smartphones, but all those kind of smart devices out there that are actually everywhere in our homes, the IoT and uh, everything remotely available. Yeah, the, the, the S in IoT is for security, you know? <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> do you have some kind of uh, suggestions on, on how we could improve the situation there other than you know living in a cave or something? I mean, as I said, one thing is, for example, for for governments, uh, for example, that if new devices are coming on the market, that they like need to have some updates for several years, for example, or have some uh, security in the beginning when when impl implementing it. On the other thing is, for example, uh, there are already some good companies out there or some good um, stuff. For example, you, if you have the knowledge, you can, for example, use open source software and build build the stuff yourself, or use alternate alternative operating system for your phone. For example, that for example, old phones can, st if you have the possibility, you can still run like Lineage OS as alternative ROM, and they have normally updates, so you can update them still if if, if it's an old phone. And um, but it's often a problem. Like if I buy some IT IT camera, it's some from some Chinese uh, company. You get you get it. You have probably some default credentials. And if it's really shitty, you can even change your credentials. And um, it's it's a big problem, as you say it. And there is also no no general solution for that. But you can try, as say, alternative software for smartphones. You can try. It to also to see if there is, for example, if you if you want to buy a security camera, you can see maybe some reviews, maybe check if there's some blog post about this camera, if they have some security vulnerabilities, or you can also check CV databases. Like you can go to a database online, put in the vendor name and see how is their security track record. They have a lot of CVs or do they have they're okay. You can also ask like the vendor, do you have security updates or not? Or so, you, so there are quite some stuff you can do, but it's not easy. It, that's true. It's, it's very hard to, currently still. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, maybe one uh, other interesting suggestion regarding the cloud stuff is uh, maybe running your own, uh, you know, gateways and cloud for those IoT things. You know, not relying on, on third parties. There are solutions where you can run a server at your home, at least, you know, uh, your data will be with you. Yes, if you have the possibility to to run your own server at home, it's great. But often not. All, um, it's a, still a quite small amount of people that have the knowledge to run their own servers at home because most of people are just consumers. They buy hardware, they buy software, they know how to use it, but they don't know how it works or how to make it better. Okay. Thank you, Hedjif. Thank you very much. See you around. <laughs> <laughs>